All right, and without any further ado, it is 3.05 p.m., so our webinar is going to begin. I'll take one last quick look here at our word cloud, kind of see where everybody's divided right now across our different webinar options, or gosh, title options <laughs> and roles. And uh, we'll come back to this towards the end of the webinar to get another look at it as we're answering our Q&A. So thank you everybody for joining us today. This is Scientific Health and Safety Career Growth Possibilities. It is a webinar in the BioRaft EHS Community Connection webinar series, where we try to bring together health and safety professionals from across all different industries and backgrounds to share best practices, experiences, and just have a place to talk about subjects that matter to them. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about career growth. Uh, hopefully that was clear from the title. <laughs> and uh, we have with us today, uh, Joe, Sarah, and AJ. Uh, so I'd like to introduce each of them, give them a chance to speak, tell us a little bit about their background, and also uh, tell us about how they came into their current career. And before we get started, just a quick call out for how these webinars tend to go for those who are new to the group. Um, these webinars have a live Q&A throughout the entire event. So we set it up specifically to make sure your questions are clear to everybody and to encourage cross conversation. So it's not just bottleneck for us. So if you go down to your Zoom webinar control panel and click on that Q&A button, you'll pop out a new panel where you can go ahead and ask your questions. Uh, we've made it so that you can respond to each other's questions with your own answers or clarifying questions. And you can thumbs up the questions you're most interested in. So we know what we should address in the live Q&A towards the end of the webinar. So Feel free to put stuff in there throughout the whole thing. I think all of our favorite webinars tend to have a really live and active Q&A. So don't be shy. If you have a question, uh, almost certainly guaranteed that several other people have the exact same one. Great. So Joe, would you mind uh, starting us off and introducing yourself? Um, sure. How far do you want me to go back? You, just a quick <laughs> intro for us right now? Yeah, uh, kind of where you're working right now, what your background is, and then maybe a three minute quick story about how you found your way to your current position. Oh, okay, sure. So um, I am, like the slide says, Joe Coffey. I am currently working for an insurance company, which is kind of bizarre, right? Wherever I go, when I go to a safety thing or a biosafety thing, and people talk about where they're, where they're working at now, I say insurance, and they all grab their wallets, making sure that I'm not trying to take their money or sell them anything. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll give you my give you my background. So I um, I attended University of California San Diego for biology, and coming out of there, I got a job as a QC microbiologist at Baxter Healthcare in Hayward, California, and I was in that lab for about six years, and uh, and I loved it. We did bio burden testing for uh, endotoxin testing, sterility testing, all sorts of release testing for our products that we're manufacturing, monoclonal antibodies um, for different therapeutics, uh, including for hemophilia and the like. And um, after about six years of, years of that, I started to think, well, what else can, you know, what else is there, what else can I do? And I, I looked at getting into a different department called quality compliance. And that was internal auditing, quality auditing, um, supplier auditing. And I loved that when the FDA came to our facility they, uh, uh, I was part of the team to, to support uh, the inspection in the facility. I love that process on both ends of, of the audit process. Being, um, audit process being finding out what do you guys do in your department, at your facility, whatever it might be. Um, how do you do that properly? Uh, what standards do you have? How do you do that safely? How do you make sure the product is safe? Um, and then are, are there any shortcomings that we might be able to help you with, issuing maybe recommendations, observations, whatever you want to call it, um, and, and improving your system and helping you. I love that process. Then a buddy came up to me uh, one day and said, are you interested in a job in insurance? And I said, yes, take me to, no. I said, no, I love where I'm at. I love what I'm doing. Um, I really don't want to sell insurance. And he said, no, 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 no. I think it'll be interesting for you. This was um, with my prior employer uh, to where I'm at now, Chubb Insurance. They were looking for uh, a person with a life science background to help out with their life science commercial clients uh, who could kind of speak their language, understood what they were doing, what kind of products they were bringing to market, understanding the safety issues in labs and in manufacturing, um, somebody with a biology background. And I thought, oh, okay, this, this sounds interesting. I had no idea this kind of a job existed, right? And, um, and so I, I went for it. And, uh, and so now I've been in the insurance side of things um, 
for, uh, well, since about 2013. Uh, and my current company is Intact Insurance Specialty Solutions. And we really focus um, on tech and life science. Uh, that's all we do. We don't do any, you know, fast food, uh, restaurant inspections, no apartments, stuff like that. So I really get to focus in on the cool and interesting stuff. Um, and, and it's great. And so, so as a safety professional in, in the insurance side, I, I do kind of like a mini audit, which I loved, um, talking with our clients about what they do, how they do it, um, what might go wrong, what might the shortfalls be, what are the codes and standards that are applicable, and, and how can we, A, provide a service to help you guys um, stay safe and don't let your building burn down, keep your employees safe, happy, comfortable. Um, and then if there's any recommendations for improvement, we, we have that avenue as well. So that's kind of my, my three minute overview. All right, great. And uh, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind going next. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Morris Benavides and I am currently serving as an Associate Director of Safety for the College of Science and Environmental Health and Safety at the University of Utah. I am 50% split between those two entities. So um, I serve as a liaison between the two, trying to represent our researchers, faculty and staff as eh &S is uh, implementing new programs. And then on the flip side, in those labs and at the bench, I'm trying to represent environmental health and safety and help our folks work more safely in their spaces. Um, I, on the slide there, I provided Matt a couple of different roles that I've interacted with across my career. So just to give folks that are, you know, maybe looking for those interesting opportunities, like Joe mentioned, um, here's a few. Uh, I will give you a few minutes about how I got here. So my first job out of the military. I'm a US Army veteran. I was a nuclear biological chemical specialist. So spent a lot of time in basically uh, SCBA and things like that during my time with the military. But after that, I joined a chemistry department as a teaching lab coordinator and a safety officer. So I was a 50% split kind of starting in my career. And now here I am again. Um, from that position, I moved into environmental health and safety where I became a hazardous materials manager. So dealing with all of the regulated waste across campus. From there, I moved to a different university where I became a laboratory safety specialist. So I really got that general background in all of the hazards. So if you think about the four majors, the radiological, biological, chemical, and physical, um, spent a lot of time doing laboratory inspections, looking at those things. From there, I moved over uh, to a National Laboratory, Ames Laboratory at Iowa State University, where I started with the environmental side, so dealing with regulated wastes again. And then I moved into a position um, taking a little bit more of a leadership role, so supervising our industrial hygiene, radiological safety, and environmental programs. And now here I am at the University of Utah. So I've kind of worked my way around becoming a generalist in all things safety and trying to put that into practice here at the university. All right, and uh, AJ, if you wouldn't mind going next. Probably would help if I unmute myself. Um, <laughs> thank you, Matt. Uh, it's great to be on here. It's great to see uh, Joe and Sarah. Uh, my, my name's AJ Triano. I serve as the chief scientific officer for a company called Safer Behaviors. Uh, I am based in the Boston area, although my company is based more down in the greater uh, Atlanta area. My colleague who started this company, his name is uh, Sean Kaufman. He's kind of a household name in, in the biosafety and clinical containment fields. But my background is I, I'm a classically trained microbiologist. I was a, a spore biologist, actually. I studied bacterial spores for many years. I went through the whole ritualistic hazing process of getting my PhD only to realize that I didn't like working at the lab bench. And that's kind of a sobering uh, position to be in after you invest, you know, nine to 10 years of school, uh, you know, you invest that time and you're going, wow, did I really think this through? And uh, believe it or not, you know, if I look at the root cause analysis of how I got to where I am, I actually, when I graduated from the University of Connecticut Medical School, they have a very small PhD program. I took the entire summer off and I went home and I actually grew up on uh, Cape Cod, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And I went back to my old summer job, which was lifeguarding. I did that for a long, long time on the Cape. It's exactly like you see on Baywatch and in the movies uh, to a T. Uh, it's not, it's a joke. Uh, 
uh, <laughs> but a lot of my friends uh, that were still lifeguarding are school people who are like school teachers, right? And they they loved going be, to be able to go back to the beach every summer. And I really took the time to kind of sit down and think, what is it that I want to do? What is it that I enjoy doing? Right. And I don't think we do that enough in our career paths. I feel like we follow these kind of predestined paradigms and we don't really see the forest through the trees sometimes. And believe it or not, I applied for a job completely on a whim with the Rhode Island Department of Health. I thought it was a position uh, working as a, a clinical microbiologist in their BSL-3 laboratory doing uh, uh, as a, a clinical microbiologist. Turns out the job was really for the biological safety officer, and then it turned out to be for the CDC select agent program responsible official. So I got that job and I really got thrown into biological safety headlong. Uh, I had no background information as what biological safety was, um, the regulations involved, uh, but I knew the research and I knew high containment research, you know, from the bench perspective. And so I really leveraged that, uh, that experience as a scientist and transitioning to biological safety. You know, fast forward now, I, I worked for Rhode Island, the Department of Health in Rhode Island during the Ebola epidemic, uh, which people I know we probably have already forgotten about, but Rhode Island has more Liberians per capita than anywhere else in the United States. So if there was going to be a ground zero for Ebola to enter the United States from Western Africa, uh, Providence was in all likelihood a very, very, very likely scenario where that could happen because there was a lot of travel coming from the hot zone back to the U.S. Now that didn't happen, but it was a really worthwhile experience working with the Department of Health, working with area hospitals, um, working with uh, Sentinel Microbiology uh, uh, clinical laboratories around the state. Um, from there, I, I went and actually uh, into, into private consulting. So uh, I, I worked for a small firm in the Boston area for a couple of years. And then right at the uh, start of the pandemic, I was down in Atlanta at a small leadership conference that the CDC puts on. And nobody was talking about coronavirus. And I had a vendor booth set up in my my then you know, friend and mentor, Sean, now my colleague, he had a vendor booth set up directly across from me. And, and we were talking for about two and a half days and we said, well, wow, you know, coronavirus, this, this could be really bad if, if nobody's talking about it. And you know, we're, we're drastically underprepared to face a, you know, a global uh, emerging threat right now. And two and a half weeks later, I was back in Massachusetts and then the state of emergency was declared. So that was like February of 2020. Um, so I, I left my role and I joined up with my, my, my good friend and mentor, Sean Kaufman, and, it, and it's, you know, it's really a, um, I don't like to use the phrase, it's a dream come true, but you don't really see yourself working, you know, with somebody who's been a, a pretty um, substantial role model and figure and mentor in your career. And now that I have that capability to, to work for Safe Behaviors, it's just, it's, it's really phenomenal. So realistically, I work in the greater Boston area as a biological safety consultant. Um, I do serve as the biosafety officer for an organization called Ginkgo Bioworks. They just went public, so they're all over the headlines right now. And now I can, you know, I can say that publicly because it is public information. So Ginkgo Bioworks is a synthetic biology company. Um, that's principally where I dedicate most of my time on site in the laboratories, but we do work domestically and internationally um, at all biosafety levels. So a really, really, really cool uh, behavioral-based biological safety needs to be working in. Wow. Right. Fantastic. Uh, really excited to hear and pick all of your brains as we talk more about careers and uh, just how you follow your joy to a place that you end up being very happy with. Uh, a quick reminder to go ahead and definitely as a question comes up, go into that Q&A button and that Q&A panel in your Zoom webinar control panel. Uh, congrats to James for already getting in there. And Joe, if you wouldn't actually mind uh, holding off there for a second. So one of the unfortunate things about Zoom webinar uh, is that if you're a panelist and you type an answer, it'll mark the question as answered and it'll be harder to find it for the future. So we can make sure we get to that in the Q&A uh, later and make sure you get a written response in there after we uh, take care of that. So to kick things off, actually, uh, AJ, I wanted to ask you a question and start this one off with you. Um, what's one piece of career advice that you wish that you started following earlier? <laughs> uh, I laugh because, right, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Um, I think early on, well, when we're in the thick of it in our careers, right, we lose perspective. When we get stuck in the daily grind, we lose perspective, right? It's hard to uh, look at your individual role uh, and then kind of get the bigger picture. Right. I think we all get stuck in that sort of day to day, nine to five, cranking through our action items that sometimes we can lose sight of the bigger picture. Um, definitely, uh, uh, I wish that I could uh, instill a sense of kind of patience and uh, a sense of if you work hard, if you treat people with respect, if you truly care about others in a safety driven field, you know, that will eventually come back to you. 
Um, so not only that, the ability to listen, uh, I am an extreme extrovert. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, we do the Myers-Briggs personality assessments at Safer Behaviors. I am about as extreme as an extrovert as you get. My colleague is an extrovert. His wife is an extrovert. When all three of us are in the same room, it's a sight to behold. Um, and so as an extreme extrovert, as soon as you're talking in the back of my mind, I'm already thinking about what I want to say next, right? And then as soon as you're done talking, I see my opening and I go for it. Um, it's very powerful if you're an extrovert when you're quiet. I mean, sometimes people always assume what, what's wrong, but the reality is the ability to listen, actively listen to people, right? And talk to them on their terms about their interests and not feel like the conversation needs to be, you know, as the extrovert would back, uh, you know, kind of in your wheelhouse. So, I mean, just the ability to really, really listen to people is a, is a, is a, is a skill that I see more and more. And I will, I will harp on my generation here. I see more and more as a skill that we're losing out on actually listening to people. So, uh, again, not losing perspective, getting stuck in the day-to-day -day grind, and really taking an interest in other people and listening to them with respect to, you know, laboratory safety environments. Yeah, and I think that we're going to see a lot of these topics come up during our conversation of things that you hear and you think, well, wait, what is that relating to careers and growth and, you know, moving to new jobs and everything? And the reality is these soft skills are just the foundation for everything that we do. And in many cases, sometimes end up being more important than a technical skill uh, and can get you farther than that and get you... Uh, through barriers and into places that you might not be able to reach with just a really profound technical knowledge. Uh, so I think that's something that we'll see here and uh, definitely curious to hear about it as it comes up more. And Joe, I was hoping to hear from you about the same question, uh, wondering if there was any career advice you wish you'd followed a little bit earlier in your career. Yeah, I think um, being open, uh, being open to meet new people, being open to talk to new people. Uh, if I hadn't been open to my buddy talking about insurance, I wouldn't have jumped from quality to safety. I wouldn't have jumped from industry to insurance. And I swear, this is the best job in the world. Uh, I'm, I'm loving it and, and I plan on retiring out of, out of this position, right? Um, but, but sometimes people will come to you and say, hey, I've got an opportunity, you know? And you say, well, I'm, ha I'm happy where I am. I, I don't wanna move. Just say, you know what, e even if I'm not interested in the opportunity that you have to talk about, maybe one of my friends would be and I can refer to them. And you have a 10 minute call with them. Uh, or, or, or better yet, you're at a, a conference, virtual webinar like this or, or in-person conference as things start to open up. Just meeting the new people, keep their business card, find them on LinkedIn um, and, and you know, touch base with them later on. Uh, you don't have to be an extrovert Speaking of extrovert, introvert, um, some of my very dear friends are, are very much described, you know, self-described introverts. And you don't have to, um, you don't have to become an extrovert to do this. Just, just listen and talk and, and keep those people, keep them in your back pocket and uh, on your LinkedIn page um, for, uh, you know, potential future opportunities. If you hear about something, think, hey, I, I know somebody who might have, you know, who might have wanted to, uh, to jump into that area. And that's kind of net, just basically networking, right? Putting on an umbrella on that, just kind of networking. And especially as an early career person, you don't know what networking is and you're not, you're not doing it and that's okay. But it's just, it's just, you know, keeping in touch with the people that you've already met and being open to talk to new people. And, and most of that's just hearing what they have to say. And that's fine. You can be an introvert or an extrovert in that position. It doesn't matter. And yeah, Sarah, I was wondering if I could also hear your thoughts on uh, overcoming the fear of reaching out to people and networking and doing that sort of initial outreach. Thanks for the question, Matt. So I, my advice, um, one, as a, so when you think about the spectrum, extrovert, introvert, I'm very much somewhere right in the middle, probably leaning towards the introvert side. But what I try to do is approach these situations as an opportunity to learn something new. Um, a career in safety always presents new challenges almost daily. So learning from someone else's experiences or expertise that they've built over their career might be exactly what you'll need facing a challenge moving forward. Um, another little tip that I picked up from someone just yesterday was, you know, especially thinking about the, the more introverted folks among us, is give yourself what you can do. So if you're in maybe a conference, um, social hour or something like that, just make a deal with yourself to meet two new people. 
if you can handle two new people. Don't go in there and think that you have to, you know, shake hands, which hopefully someday we'll maybe get to do again. AJ, you can probably give me better, you know, tips on that. But, um, you know, just give yourself something that you can do. Meet two new people or, or tag along with someone else from either your organization or maybe a mentor or something like that that can introduce you to other people who may know, you know, this person's an expert in your area. Um, we were just working on something together and I thought you should meet them or, you know, similar situations like that. Don't be afraid to ask for help with that networking. It's not always the easiest thing, especially when you're just getting started. But Joe also gave some good tips on, you know, reaching out on LinkedIn, um, you know, ask questions, talk to people, learn something new. And I personally really love that asking questions perspective. Uh, you know, there's a big fear, uh, I've seen just generally, of admitting that you don't know everything. That's something that we can feel very anxious about. Uh, and I found oftentimes it's sort of the exact opposite, that when I kind of admit my ignorance about something and I say, hey, you know, you know, you know a lot about this. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this and then get that information. It's a great way to open up a conversation and, uh, you know, hold yourself uh, in a higher regard with that person in terms of integrity, which matters a lot when it comes to forging these bonds. I think that's a great point, Matt, if I can add, ju just to be mm -hmm. humble. Don't, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Um, and especially, in, I think in our position as safety people, um, we wanna come in having a background understanding of, of what is this best practice? What does this code say? Uh, but if we're going into a, a lab or um, you know, a manufacturing space or wherever it might be, they're the experts. Go in, go in and just start asking questions. I, I, hey, you're the expert, man. I don't know, you know, and, and just learn. And I think that as far as soft skills go, goes, that, um, that helps, that helps uh, win them over a little bit too, I think. Just to tag on one more thing with that, that's a great point. And one of the things that I found, especially with folks doing research in spaces, is they are the expert in whatever it is they're doing. So feel free to ask them the question. And then, and then of course, you know, I always tend to bring it back to safety in some way, shape or form. Like, okay, so what, what steps did you take to mitigate this hazard? Or, you know, but let them talk about their research, the steps that they've gone through to set it up and then ask those questions as you talk with them. That's a great point. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about career movement, not just kind of making these connections, but how do you actually guide yourself to a place where you'd like to go? So I'm going to ask the same question to all three of you, uh, starting with you, AJ. Uh, so where do you see people getting hung up on career movement? And what's a good way of getting unstuck if you're feeling like you want to get out, try a different thing, and you're just not sure how you can possibly get started with it? Yeah, yeah. Um... I think it's really, really easy in, in our in our field uh, to feel stuck. Um, and I had an old colleague when I worked in Rhode Island uh, for the state of Rhode Island. He was the loading dock supervisor and he was one of those classic, you know, old timers had been there for 35 years. And I'd always go down and talk to, I was always at the loading dock all the time. We had, you know, biological waste coming in, whatever, that's where we store it. We had other stuff. We actually had a cooler, the rabies cooler where people would drop off, you know, dead bats and stuff. And we had to go test it for rabies. It was great, great time. Um, but I used to always go and talk with him because he would always tell me, don't get frustrated. And I can hear it in my head every day when I encounter a problem going, why am I dealing with this? Why hasn't this happened yet? He would say, don't get frustrated. Don't get frustrated. You know, he had 35 years that he could look back on, right? And it's really hard when you work in a safety driven field because your success is really predicated on uh, the well being of others and not really your own personal achievements, right? You have to look at your success as did everybody go home safely? Great. Then that is a successful day, right? You're never going to get that kind of instant gratification or or, you know, pat on the back or affirmation that you may be looking for. Now, in terms of getting unstuck, there's two things you have to focus on. One is what is within my control and what is what isn't, right? So always try to focus on what, what is within your own control, whether that's developing your skill set, developing your network, right? Taking a intelligent risk, looking at maybe some continuing op educational uh, opportunities. Those are within your control. What's out of your control is going to be, you know, organizational politics, right? Or, or, you know, stagnant leadership or any of those things, right? Anything that's out of your control, you cannot um, get fixated on that because all that's going to do is waste your time. And so my advice would be focus on what you can, 
you know, ultimately change. And the things that you can't change, ultimately, you cannot worry about. And believe it or not, if you can focus on what within your control, you'd be amazed at what kind of doors will open uh, for you. Yeah, and just to uh, build off a little bit in reference what you mentioned in your introduction, it seems like a big part of that too is asking yourself the why, you know, what do I like doing? What brings me joy? What seems exciting to me? Why do I not feel satisfied with what I'm doing right now? Uh, only you can answer those questions, but the better that you can answer them, uh, the easier it'll be to really have that other thing, stuff come through. Uh, Joe, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind chiming in and telling us about uh, ways you think people might be able to sort of get unstuck if they're feeling like they want to move and aren't quite sure how to get started. That's that's a good question. So I, I look at that in two ways. Um, one is if, if you feel stuck at your current um, position or company, and another one if you feel stuck in your field, right? So I've, I've changed companies a couple of times over the years, and I've changed the fields, I would say twice, uh, two major field changes. And, and I would say for both of them, uh, the advice that I would say is to stay flexible. I, ha I knew one guy, and I'll, I'll never forget this, um, this quote. He said, never stay at a company longer than two years. By then, you know everything and you need to get out. And when you get out, you know, you get a job title, you get a little pay raise. And I thought, okay, that rule for him is working. I was at Baxter for nine years and I loved it. There were days where it was obviously, you know, there, you always have those days, right? Um, but if I had tried to stick to a rule like that, it would have been, I think, detrimental um, long-term for me. I wouldn't be here where I am now, that's for sure. Um, on the other hand, did I stay too long in one department? Did I stay too long in one position? Yeah, I think logically looking back on my, my own career, I can say certainly I probably did. And I should have been a little bit more flexible and more, like I said earlier, open to talking to more people. Now, from a career change perspective, um, like a field, difference if you want to get into safety or if you're in safety and you want to get out of safety which why would you want to do that i don't know but um but if you want to jump out then um i would say professional organizations are a great way to meet people in that field to talk with them to understand um what's going on i remember a time back at baxter where i joined the american society for quality the parental drug association and Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. And I'm still, I'm not, I don't pay the dues on those right now, but um, because that's not where I'm at, right? But I still get those emails. So I still, I still look and I still check out their webinars from, from now and again. Um, and it's, you know, maybe it's a $10 webinar or something like that, but maybe you, you learn something. Maybe you make a connection. Um, find the speaker on LinkedIn and connect with them. There are 84 participants right now. If I don't get 84 LinkedIn invites, come on, this is easy. Just, just find me on LinkedIn. Um, and I'd be happy to talk with, with people more, but I think be, be flexible, be flexible with your, with your thinking, um, and be open to more opportunities, be open to change. And Sarah, if you wouldn't mind closing us out on this particular question about ways that you found have been useful for getting unstuck when you're feeling uh, a little bit trapped in your current spot. I'd love to, Matt. Um, I'm actually going to start with your your thing about ask yourself why. Why are you interested? Why are you doing it? What do you love about your job? What do you not love? Um, so I have some other questions that you can ask yourself to you know, maybe help you find a direction to move so that way you don't stay in that stuck position. So um, first question would be, do you wanna learn something about a different area within safety? So um, as I describe myself, I'm probably a safety generalist. I know enough about everything to know I need to go ask more questions of an actual expert. So maybe maybe that's your thing. Maybe you're currently a radiation safety person or a chemical hygiene officer, but you really want to learn something else. So maybe you find yourself a, a coworker in a similar position that would be willing to cross train with you. I I've done that several times throughout my career, just cross training with my, my coworkers to learn more about their different fields. Um, on the other hand, do you wanna be an expert in your field? So are you really, pardon the pun, laser focused on laser safety? If so, <laughs> you know, maybe that's an opportunity to become certified as a laser safety officer. 
Um, another thing would be, you know, are you looking to advance into leadership roles? This is a great time to maybe talk with your supervisor, take some, you know, whatever your organizational or organizational leadership training is, um, or, you know, ask for leadership roles like chair a committee or, um, you know, lead a project. So that way you've got some project management skills, sponsor an intern. That's another thing I've done a couple of different times. It, it's just an opportunity to build those skills in that area. Um, finally, I would just say really talk with a supportive supervisor, friend, coworker, whatever that looks like for you and have them help you brainstorm ways to move forward, just to get down the path. Sometimes just getting the ball rolling will help you, you know, get out of the stuck and motivated toward whatever direction it is that brings you your why. And just to sort of build off of that, uh, you know, in addition to this challenge of how do I not only try to move away from something, but actively move towards it, sometimes the thing that we know we want to do may not necessarily exist, uh, you know, per se, or at least not that we know of. So do you have any advice for how somebody might go about creating a brand new brand position or, a, you know, opportunity for themselves that might not be previously existing? Oh, goodness. So um, I, I'm actually in my second position that is brand new to the organization that I'm in. So uh, one of the things that I've done, uh, I've, I've also created my own position kind of out of thin air before. So one of the things that you can do in that situation is again, you know, talk with your, your support network. What does that look like? Um, look towards whatever strategic plan, mission values, uh, things like that that are available to you and try to build a position to meet those goals or objectives. So thinking about maybe maybe within an environmental health and safety department, maybe you've got a strategic plan to really focus on getting safety culture out and about in your organization. So look at those, those items that will need to be accomplished to meet that and start working on kind of a bare bones position description of what type of a person or what type of a role would fulfill those things. And then, you know, build that out for yourself, kind of do your own SWOT analysis on where you are and how you could fit that role. And then take that to your leadership, show them the value that it would bring to your organization and then, you know, move forward. Um, another, you know, especially, thinking about it from where I currently am, where I was hired into a brand new position at the university, throughout the interview process, I really listened to what they were looking for. Um, there was a, you know, a pretty bare bones position description for when I applied, but throughout the day long interview process, I really heard a lot of information about what they were looking for out of the position. So within my first month on site, I built myself kind of a a plan, a, you know, zero to three months, six to nine months, nine to 12, a year, 18 months further, you know, trying to build that out. So that way I could take that to my leadership and say, here's what I heard during the interview process. And here's where I would like to go. Yeah. And just to connect it back to what Joe and AJ said as well um, earlier about active listening, uh, you know, somebody who is also very much in that uh, previously in that um, category of just waiting until I can find that perfect opening to jump in with my response versus actively listening and trying to comprehend. It's amazing. The things that you can learn and uncover when you're really paying close attention to what somebody's saying and where you can find these trends and say, hey, wait a second. It sounds like what you're saying actually is that this and this are problems. But if I do this thing, it's not going to fix those. But if I do this other thing, if I you know fill this role, if I have these responsibilities crossing over, I could do that much better. Um, so just again, getting back to those soft skills and really thinking about, you know, what you can do to help the other people around you and, you know, weave that into your own career path. Then in terms of advancing your own career and trying to just keep getting up and keep rising, you know, Sarah, like you mentioned, kind of breaking through some of that ceiling by creating a new job opportunity. Uh, AJ, I was wondering if you could tell us uh, about some ways that uh, somebody in a scientific health and safety position um, could get through a ceiling if they do hit one, you know, what are some ways of just breaking through that barrier if you decide you want to keep moving up, but you feel like there's something stopping you? Sure. 
there's no shortage of opportunity in our respective fields. There really isn't. Um, if you're looking at uh, either, uh, um, uh, you know, from Joe's perspective as kind of a, a risk control specialist or more of the, you know, traditional EHS uh, or, or biological safety or any of the kind of relevant safety fields, there is absolutely no shortage of opportunity. If anything, um, uh, there's there's almost an abundance of opportunity because there's no real traditional academic you know, or career path that gets you, at least in the biological safety. Most of the senior leaders in this field, their stories are all just as unique as the one I presented, where I thought I was applying for a different job and boom, now I'm a biosafety officer. Um, and that's kind of the one unique thing about the entire field. So if you hit a ceiling, you have a very diverse skill set, um, not just in what you are doing, right? Like I said, we get stuck in that grind of the day to day and it becomes a very myopic view. And you realize just how valuable you are, not just in what you're doing, but in all these other skill sets you've developed. Um, and so you are highly, um, um, uh, uh, those skills are leverageable across multiple different industries. Now I'm a little bit biased because I'm a consultant and I've been a consultant for many years now. Um, and so the reality is uh, if you are hitting a ceiling, my biggest advice I tell people, and believe it or not, my colleague Sean is a behavioral psychologist. So, you know, I get the, the psychology 101 every time I pick up the phone and call him. And, and so by proxy, I feel like I'm becoming a behavioral psychologist with a lot of my clients and colleagues, is to take a break and take a step back. Um, one of the best things I did when I was getting burnt out a couple of years ago consulting, I think it was 2019, I took a trip to California out to Joe's neck of the woods to visit a buddy of mine. And then I actually went down to Costa Rica to Tamarindo on the West Coast, and I went surfing for 10 days. It was a bucket list item of mine. And uh, it was kind of like the first time I really disconnected. So if you do hit a ceiling, uh, my biggest advice for you is to disconnect for a bit. Uh, because again, if you start to focus too much on things that are out of your control, which a lot of times, if you are hitting a ceiling, you can't get through that next level. There isn't the opportunity being presented to you at your current organization. A lot of times there will be a lot of factors that aren't in your control. And if you get hung up on those, then what is within your control will suffer right? You'll start to waste time on, on, on things that you shouldn't be wasting time on. Taking a break and taking a step back, the work will always be there, right? The work will always be there. And if nothing else, you'll be that much more valuable when you do come back, <laughs> right? Now, uh, what realistically, would it be great to take a break for a month or two? Sure, that's not available to most people, and I completely understand that. But again, I'll harp back on what my old buddy Bill used to say at the loading dock, don't get frustrated, Right, you do. You are valuable. You you do have a very good skill set in a lot of different things. If you work in the safety driven field, and so if you are hitting a ceiling at your current organization, polish up that resume and start you know start working your network and seeing what kind of opportunities are out there. You'd be very very surprised. Yeah, maybe you learn a little bit about what's beyond the ceiling. Really talk to the people who are there and understand what's there. You might find another alternate way there that you weren't expecting or realize, oh, wait a second, I don't actually want this. I think uh, we've, many of us have heard of the Peter principle, this idea that many people end up in their careers at a level one above where they actually are because you just sort of keep advancing past that. And there's something very real to be said for stopping and saying, hey, I'm actually happy here. I don't need to go up to the next level. I, don't, I like having more task related instead of budgetary or leadership related responsibilities. Uh, those things change a lot. Joe, I was wondering if you could tell us now a little bit about a time you came to a career crossroads and how you navigated that particular experience. Yeah, that's a good question. So <clears throat> I would say the big, the big thing for me was changing from, um, uh, from biologic manu manu biologics manufacturing environment at Baxter uh, over to a safety professional in an insurance company. Um, and that, as I, as I mentioned early on, uh, it came to me with just a buddy, who, a fellow in the quality department, um, came up to me and said, are you looking for an opportunity? And <clears throat> excuse me, where I was at, um, I was in that quality auditing department. I had worked hard to get um, my certified quality auditor certification um, to build my credibility uh, in a relatively short time, I think, in that department um, and, and come to a place where I was really loving the work. Uh, and, and very happy. Um, and so I really wasn't looking to move. And I, I said, no, this is what I said. I said, no, but what do you got? And he, he literally opened his arms wide and said, insurance, like it was some gift from heaven, right? <laughs> he 
And I'm like, well, no, I'm not going to sell insurance. I'm not interested. But he he further explained, you know, his wife was a hiring manager and they they needed this person with a life science background. And it's really not, it's not selling insurance. It's a safety professional um, uh, uh, type of um, uh, type of field. And I had done, um, you know, risk assessments, safety assessments, job hazard assessments. I had done accident investigations. I had participated on our, our, uh, our facility safety team for years. Um, had a very close relationship with the EHS professionals on site. And I loved what, what they were doing for us in the lab um, and, and on, on site there. Um, and so I admired that about, about them. Um, and I felt close to the, to the safety field in that way. So that kind of piqued my interest. Another thing was I knew this guy, I, I trusted him, um, and, and something about it just said, you know what, just find out more. And so I went through the whole interview process, the whole application process, just with the idea of I'm finding out more. When I went to do the interviews there, I think they were scheduled for with three people for maybe an hour and a half. I think I was there for three hours because we were really interviewing each other. And that's, that was a really good position to be in because I had a job, right? I wasn't looking to move. I had a steady paycheck and I liked my job. So if you're going into an interview, I would say, especially for a big career jump like that, don't, and, and it'll be hard. It's a, it's a behavior, it's a mentality. Don't go in with the mentality of, I need this job. Uh, you'll be more nervous. You'll, you'll, you won't ask you know, the best questions that kind of naturally come up. Um, and you won't get as much out of the experience, I think. If you're looking to make that kind of a jump um, in, in any, you know, whether it's to a department or a bigger career change, um, try and, and, and of course, that's a blessing that I, I had. I had a job. If you don't have a job, of course, that doesn't apply. There's a little more writing on it. So I'm not talking about that. But if you can, go in with the mindset of, um, I just want to find out. I'm interviewing them. They're interviewing me, but I'm interviewing them too. Um, and at, so after that process, um, it was it was a lot of consultation with my wife, talking about this. This would be a big career change. Um, I had worked hard uh, to be where I was at, and this was kind of starting fresh. And would I like it? Could I do it? Um, and I think I ended up really underestimating it, everything that I had to learn and understand um, to now become, uh, you know, certified as as a certified safety professional that I am now and getting that background in that in that position to to get that expertise but so it was a lot of talking and 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 discussion and um and you know some people you know meditate or pray or whatever get that get that good feeling about it right um and then and then go for it that so that's what I did <laughs> I don't know I don't know if that answers the question very well or not but that was my that was my experience and it was great it turned out beautifully. No, absolutely. I think that that attitude of curiosity, uh, coupled with uh, more of an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset, can really just unlock doors and open people up to wanting you as a as an employee or wanting to do things for you and appreciating you uh, in ways that are difficult to recreate through other means. Just having that engagement uh, and, like you said, sort of having that discovery mindset. You know, realizing I don't want to sell insurance turned into, wait, maybe I can, and let me know if I'm getting this wrong, it sounds like uh, reward companies for doing well on safety by saving them money, which is kind of a, a great spot to be in. You turn go from safety officer to Santa Claus. <laughs> I don't even deal with the money. And yeah. that's the best part. Like I, I can understand a little bit about sprinkler calculations because we do fire risk and all that too. It's not just worker safety, right? Um, and, but you put a dollar sign in front of numbers and I just go funny a little bit and I don't need to know about that. So that's, that's all a whole different department that does the, you know, will this save me money? I don't worry about that. I'm worried about making sure you guys go home, you know, as, as my client, uh, which is just what a, a you know, an onsite EHS manager or safety officer would be doing there as well. The, the beautiful thing is, um, I think, and I think I'm spoiled in this way as a safety professional. If if Sarah goes into a lab on at at U of U and and finds you know the the flammables aren't controlled properly, whatever, um, she's gonna she's gonna implement you know a solution and work with that that uh, that PI or whoever might be responsible to work with that solution. 
I, I consult with those solutions, um, but I don't have I don't have the ownership of putting that whole thing in place, which I think spoils me a little bit. But man, I mean, it's still it's still a consultative approach that we have to say, you know what, here's our best practices. Where are you guys at? And how, how can I help you? How can we provide a service to get you there? Uh, but I don't have I feel like, gosh, Sarah, I, I don't have that same ownership that you might, you know. So and and that's a that's a blessing for me. I think it's great, um, and it, it's it's a fascinating place for me to be at because this you know this week I visited two or three different clients and saw two or three different ways that they do things and different exposures. But but the codes are the same. Uh, Cal OSHA is the same. Fed OSHA is the same. You know we still need to keep each other safe. So it's all about it's all about what can we do to to help them do that. You know, but it's not owning the solution. It's a little bit different. Fantastic. So before we move on to the uh, next portion of our webinar here, we're going to do a quick change of pace and let you know about some upcoming webinars. And in the meantime, I'm also going to launch a poll. So these are the EHS Community Connection webinars. You know, we rely very heavily on you, our community, to keep them going, whether it's letting us know what topics are interesting to you so that we can keep providing webinars that are, you know, of interest, valuable for you, our community. Uh, we want to keep doing that. And of course, these webinars wouldn't be possible without our panelists. So a huge thank you to the three of you for lending your time and expertise to making this conversation possible. And we absolutely would love to know if you or somebody in your network would be interested in participating in an upcoming webinar. You know, I think that these are just a great chance to learn from everybody, uh, really value different perspectives, all the way down from specialists to generalists to leadership. Uh, it always feels like there's some new information that comes out from the meeting of these different groups. So I'm going to leave that up and look forward to hearing from you about uh, you know, your interests there. Let you know that we have a few webinars coming up. Uh, in two weeks, we'll be talking about conflict resolution techniques, uh, which is just a supremely valuable skill. Ultimately, I think as we will talk more about uh, during that webinar, kind of everything comes down to conflict resolution, whether it's something that you're a part of or something that you are mediating for others. Uh, then we're gonna be getting into more technical land, talking about reducing hazardous waste costs for your hazardous waste program, as well as uh, discussing chemical inventory and fire codes and getting into some of that nitty gritty as well. So looking forward to having folks on for these and uh, we will have that up for a little bit. And just a reminder to everybody that if you do have a question you'd like to ask here from our audience, uh, other attendees, uh, we have about on average 16 years of experience per person uh, on these webinars. A lot of really great uh, information to plumb. Go ahead and jump over to the Q&A panel over in the Zoom control panel and you can ask your question there. So we can answer those. You can respond to each other's comments and questions. Just a great opportunity to have some crosstalk during that. So getting back to that first question over in the Q&A, uh, actually, before we do that, <laughs> a reminder to participate in our um, prompt of the week and hear about what your current position is. You know, we're talking about careers, but we want to know where you all are currently at. So taking a quick look at the spread here, it's uh, always interesting to see where people are across chemical safety, biosafety, general lab management, uh, director levels, um, coordinators, all that great stuff here. So um, feel free to go ahead and jump in and do that. I'm going to go ahead and share that information again in the chat just to make it easier. And we can go ahead and get started with our live Q&A. So first question here is from James asking uh, a question for all of our panelists. Which books, articles, or podcasts would you recommend to either read or listen in order to enhance one's understanding of the subject matter discussed today? And uh, yeah, Joe, feel free to type your answer in now. Sorry. Thanks for, the, <laughs> for holding off on that. No, you're good. Uh, the good news is, Matt, because I just moved into a brand new uh, apartment, as evidenced by everybody can see, there's a TV here, my Peloton is directly behind me, and there's a bunch of boxes, is that I actually had the boxes from my bookshelf right behind me. So James asked a question about books, and uh, I could plug uh, my company's own book, which is called Prepare and Protect by Safer Behaviors, which is actually a really, really great uh, 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 it's a great almost textbook, but also every chapter has an introduction written by a uh, subject matter expert in the field. And I actually wrote a chapter in here about how I started uh, in biosafety, which is really interesting. That's a technical read. If you want something that's more of a soft skill read, then you can't go wrong with how to win friends and influence people. I mean, this is the quintessential guide. And yes, it is close to, you know, 80 years it's been in print, but, uh, 
you know, I just read this for the first time a month and a half ago. And I kind of said, where has this book been my whole life? Because it's really about how we deal with people, how we, um, how we hold ourselves around people, how we hold uh, uh, other people. Um, it, it really is just an incredible read uh, on, uh, on not just um, how to carry yourself, but also to, to become interested in other people in ways that you probably didn't think of. And I will say one of the most powerful tools I use as a consultant when I go into a new meeting is I just ask one question and I'll say, what concerns you? If I have a business lead, what concerns you? And then I stop talking. And usually uh, just from that question alone, you'd be amazed at some of the answers that you get. Um, so. I'll chime in with a couple of different books. Um, and, and it's more thinking about the previous webinar where I served as a panelist. Aaron Todd taught me that um, a lot of doing safety you do through others. And so two books thinking about that. One is Influencer, The New Science of Leading Change. That's been um, a good read. And uh, I've also listened to it too, because that helps me form my words when I'm talking with other people. Um, and then another one is Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. It's just, you know, getting out there and doing the work. <laughs> And I can definitely second um, the how to influence and influence people. Uh, of course, the book is written a long time ago. <laughs> Some of the examples are a little <laughs> bit outdated, uh, but the core fundamentals really do apply. And if you can sift through that, uh, that was a book that I read early on. That was a huge one. And also Brene Brown is phenomenal for anybody who hasn't read her work. Um, really just a, a great thing. And Joe, you mentioned a few things in your answer just for folks on the recording, if you wouldn't mind sharing your response as well. Uh, that way the Q and A isn't uh, accessible for them usually. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I just said I would I would actually focus on, and not entirely focus obviously, but but my first thought was attend webinars like this. Um, that way you get to learn about a new topic, uh, perhaps in a new field. Uh, at the same time, you're, you're kind of by default networking. You can chat with people in the chat like we're doing here. Um, you can uh, you can find them on LinkedIn afterwards. And in fact, and I didn't put this in my answer, but um, uh, the local chapter uh, 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 versions of, of ASSP, of ABSA, um, things like that are really great. They usually have um, you know a small one day seminar that you could go to or sometimes virtual. Um, and then you could just get engaged uh, with the people there. They're, they're always looking for volunteers. Uh, so just take, uh, you know, an evening out of your week and, uh, and, and a volunteer to be, um, you know, social media person or, or vice president of whoever, right. Um, just to be able to get, so there, that way you're learning and you're networking and, and it's much more engaging than reading a book, uh, nothing against books. Books are important, <laughs> but I mean, if we're talking about advancing our careers, you can read all the books you want. And if you never talk to somebody, it's not gonna, it's not gonna have the same impact. I have yes, one other thought. Um, thinking about folks being on LinkedIn and kind of using that as a professional uh, networking and and you know pr professional social media, whatever you want to call that platform. Um, one of the things that I love, um, I follow a lot of the different TED or TED Talk organizations and things like that, and I will get um, you know feeds regularly of. 10 talks to get you motivated or 10 talks to get you out of, you know, feeling whatever it is, 10 talks to deal with rejection, those types of things. So, you know, usually you can get those done within a 20 minute time span. So just keep an eye on those or just, you know, get on the TED site and start typing in what you're, what you're dealing with currently, whether it's being stuck, whether it's, you know, you, you're dealing with a difficult situation or you're thinking about, um, you know, growth and, and, and the future. There, there's all sorts of different things. And I'm just gonna share this link quickly in chat here. Um, uh, we have, uh, our panelists have shared their LinkedIn profiles here on our webinar page. <laughs> um, so you can go ahead and go to that page and you'll be able to connect with them. Say a quick hello. You know, I'll reach out to people and say, "Hey, I saw you on this webinar. I really liked what you had to say about this thing. I had a question about this. This is my experience. What do you think?" Uh, <laughs> not to sign you all up for a whole lot of messages, but you know, I I think that that's a great. If you're looking for a formula, you're not quite sure how to reach out to somebody you've never spoken with before. 
um, it's just a great opportunity to do that and also demonstrate you've been listening. Nobody really likes sort of getting these generic cut and copy things where you can say, okay, well, you have no idea what we talked about and you're just sort of, am I one of 500 people who's doing this? So any chance you have to make things a little more personal, kind of show that you were there and putting in some work, that can really make a big difference. We have a question in the chat here from Sandra asking, I've only recently changed careers in the last year and would like to make myself more marketable for that next job. What certificates have you found to be valuable? And, you know, of course, that will manage a little bit uh, based on the jobs that you're looking for. Um, but have you found in general any particular certificates or certifications or things that you might want to consider? Yes, uh, I'll go. I'll go first. I, th I think and I think it depends on depends on a lot of things. Right. So I'll speak from my experience, uh, starting with Baxter, the, the company promoted and encouraged us to receive professional certifications and credentials. Um, and so starting in that microbiology lab, um, I, I studied for and sat for the, the exam for, um, for registered microbiologist, which I think doesn't even exist anymore. And I'm sorry I let it lapse. Um, and then in my next department, I, I was encouraged and, and it was all paid for, right? The training, um, uh, studying, any study materials, and then sitting for the test, registering, because my gosh, it's a racket, right? Uh, <laughs> putting, getting, getting these professional certifications but I sat for my certified quality auditor. Um, and, and so that from, a, from, um, from the business's point of view, it's, I think it's helpful to them. I shouldn't have said it's a racket, uh, but, <laughs> but it's helpful to them to say, hey, you know, we employ people who are professional, who are experts in their field, who know what's going on. And, and this is one way of showing that, that this is the case. So in our microbiology lab, we have registered microbiologists. For our auditors, we have certified quality auditors. Then when I moved to Chubb Insurance uh, prior to my current position, they encouraged me to get my uh, certified safety professional um, accreditation and, and, uh, and they paid for that process. You had to go through to get your associate safety professional first, um, sat for that exam and then moved to the CSP. But I remember, I remember my boss saying, you know, the CSP is the gold standard for safety professionals um, and, and they encouraged everybody to get their CSP. Uh, there are many other certifications and credentials, though, uh, that'll be applicable in different. Uh, ABSA has has their own um, credentialing uh, uh, system as well. Uh, some very well respected credentials there too. So, so it depends on what you're what you're looking at, and it depends on if you can get it paid for. I don't. If I if I didn't have all this paid for, I might not have done it. You know, uh, but that's a personal choice. And before we move on to give you, Sarah, and AJ a chance to answer, just wanted to acknowledge that we are a little bit over our scheduled webinar end time. So if either of you do need to get going, uh, feel free to drop off, no problem at all. Um, but thank you very much for your time and for being here today. But if you do have a couple more minutes, I'd love to hear your thoughts about any particular certifications that uh, you think are important. So AJ, if you wouldn't mind going next and letting us know. Sure. Yeah, no, um, uh, totally fine. Uh, plenty of time, Matt, for you and for, for everyone on the call today. Um, you know, APSA has great credentials. They've got the registered biosafety professional. They have, and then, the, you know, that is an experience and a kind of education requirement. And then they have the certified biological safety professional, which involves sitting for an exam, which I'm actually sitting for 20 days from now. So no pressure. Um, so I'm sitting for that exam. And again, that's kind of another gold standard. Um, you know, in our industry, um, there's also international certifications. I think the International Federation of Biosafety Associations, IFBA, has a certified safety professional. Any of these organizations, whether, you know, it's ASP, CSP, RBP, all these acronyms, having a credential is kind of a, a, a two-way street in that, yes, you establish yourself as now being a credentialed professional in your given field. But it also comes with a great deal of increased responsibility. Now that you hold that credential, right, you've got to put it into practice. You've got to take what you've learned, you've studied for, you've been tested on, and you got to apply it, right? And so I would caution people, don't just go out there and get every credential under the sun, because the reality is you can study hard and you can take an exam and you can pass it. But then you may not actually utilize what it is that you were, you know, being credentialed for. And so you want to obviously be very cognizant of that and not just try to get every acronym under the sun on, on the other side of your name. Because if it's not something you're actively doing or, or maybe even actively passionate about, then, you know, that credential is, is, isn't going to hold the kind of weight that you want it to. So that would be my advice. 
Great. And Sarah, if you'd like to round us up. I'll chime in just because this is so timely. I just had this conversation with our executive director of VHNS this morning. I have never personally found, you know, the motivation to really get a certificate because, because I have been that self-proclaimed generalist. I don't, the CSP is probably the most applicable, but I just, it, I don't feel the need to do it. So I'm, you know, and, and it's not been required of any of the positions that I've held. So that's, a, that's another, you know, kind of thought process. And I feel like I'm far enough into my career now that I would be doing it, as AJ mentioned, just to put those letters behind my name. Because I really am, you know, I'm at the point where I just kind of am kind of that conduit for information. I put the people in touch with the right people that know exactly what is needed. I, I know enough to know, ooh, this doesn't look right. So that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of my role currently. So I'm, you know, I'm toying with the idea, but I'm probably not likely to go down that path. Right. Well, Sarah, thank you. you could probably, sorry, Matt, Sarah, I was just going to say, Sarah, you could probably sit for the CSP and you'd pass. I bet you. I probably could, but again, like, are those dollars that we really need to spend at this moment? It's See, not and that's the thing, right? right. <laughs> yeah. This has been a fantastic discussion. I'm gonna go ahead and take one more quick look at our word cloud here, kind of see where everybody's located and uh, get a real spread of the diversity in our audience. You know, it's so nice to see so many different people coming together and sharing their experiences. And I feel like that's led to some really fantastic conversations. Before we go, I wanted to read out one comment from the chat uh, from one of our attendees saying, thank you panelists, great advice. I'm currently on a forced break, not a situation I would have chosen for family or financial reasons, but I have discovered the silver lining is time to reassess my personal and professional career. Realized how burned out I was and wrongly focusing on things I couldn't change. Uh, now I look forward to new opportunities and possibilities. So I just wanna say a quick shout out. Uh, congratulations, that is such a difficult frame shift and perspective to adopt uh, in the middle of an unexpected break. And that really shows a lot of strength and a lot of resiliency so huge kudos to anybody who is out there right now dealing with the fallout of COVID and just general work, finding themselves in a place where they need to reassess what they want to do and moving forwards. Those things are really hard to do. And uh, congratulations to you for finding that strength. And, uh, without any further ado, we can get going and say goodbye to you folks. And uh, we will talk with you again in two weeks. And another big thank you to our panelists for helping to create the space for us all to have these conversations. Thank you, thanks, Matt. Matt. Yeah, thanks, Matt. This is great. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. I will talk with you soon.